Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. We have a great show for you this week. We've been driving a lot of different cars. Uh, but with that, I'm going to bring in West Coast Editor, Senior West Coast Editor for all things up and down the West Coast, James Riswick. What's going on, man? Just sitting in a Silverado recording a podcast. Story of your life, right, man? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we so it's will. actually though you see normally if I if I don't have my if if you know the the house is loud or whatever I sit in my Z3 in the garage but that's unavailable. I've Got to tell you this is uh, much more um, civilized and spacious. Instead of zero cup holders to put my water, I, I have uh, uh, three and nice big flat sp space to put a very non car friendly car mug in. Uh, you know you have the. The, the standard weird rubber mat in the middle of the center console that GM's been putting in for years. Perfect size for my phone on silent. It's just, it's a, it's, it's a lovely mobile podcast studio. But we can talk about those later. We have a great show. Lots of things to talk about. You're actually doing what I've been doing with some of my um, like preschool drop-off and things, which is use an actual mug as opposed to a travel mug. I will just especially in the bigger, like the trucks and the SUVs, like GM and Ford and Ram trucks and SUVs, you could put cavernous amounts of like liquids in those cup holders. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I learned from a very, I, 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 I grew up with uh, an Acura Integra and a Honda CRV just reeking of coffee because my mother, despite travel mugs, would spill all over the place. So uh, I don't know. I think you're playing with fire there. That seems, that seems sketchy. Oh, I, oh my, my, uh, my mug here will remain uh, in, in a parked car. And I still might just end up spilling it. So there you go. we'll see. That could be, that, that may, may be coming later on the podcast. There we go. We'll, uh, we'll have to edit out the spills, maybe, or maybe we'll leave them in. They add a little texture and fluidity sure. to the podcast. And swearing, yeah. There we go. So we're going to talk about the Silverado High Country, the GMC Sierra, Denali Ultimate. So James has been driving, speaking of those big GM trucks, he's been driving a couple of them. Other things, uh, well, speaking of GM trucks, we've got the Escalade V. I uh, also spent some time in the Volkswagen Jetta, which took you down memory lane a little bit. I think that's kind of cool. And uh, yeah, we'll round out the car section with some time in the BMW X3, M40i, and the Honda HRV. We will spend your money, and we have a little bit of a, a preview of the Cadillac Lyric. Uh, senior editor for all things green, John Snyder, is driving it right now. He filed a dispatch this week. Uh, you'll want to kind of wet your whistle for what that's all about. We'll have the full review on site and in future podcasts. So uh, with that, why don't we just talk about uh, some big GM trucks? Tell us about what you're yeah. sitting in. Well, I am currently sitting in uh, the Chevy Silverado 1500 High Country with the optional 6.2 liter V8 as well as the optional Super Cruise system. So it's a very succinct, short, uh, short named uh, vehicle. Um, and in fact, I've been driving back to back with a purple BMW in between, I should say. Um, this and the GMC Sierra 1500 Denali ultimate so these are the the highest possible silverado sierras you can get now this also these are both uh, the first time i've been in the chevy trucks with the new interior before the interiors were quite um hmm, gm didn't really try very hard um and they were not not good at all especially in these fancy pants trucks where you have like F-150 King Ranch and Platinum and Limited and the all basically every Ram 1500. Um, and GM just didn't, just utterly whiffed, like no, no effort. As much effort as they put in elsewhere in the truck, there's none in the interior. And you could really tell in like the Denali and in the high country where there was just a little bit of quote wood or even not even wood, just kind of weird plastic trim, slapped to the door, slapped to the side of the center console. Good enough. Goodbye. And uh, this time they have seriously stepped it up. I am sitting in the Silverado High Country. And to start, uh, the leather in here is uh, blue. It's lovely. 
I, I really like uh, that automakers are putting color into leather interiors and uh, making things interesting. Uh, it has open pore, what I assume is wood. If this isn't wood, it's very impressive uh, simulation. Uh, there's some lovely kind of bronze cross stitching in the seats with some like black cord piping. Um, and then, you know, you have more of that wood on the dash and then you have this gigantic um, widescreen uh, touchscreen. Uh, let me see exactly how big it is. It is 13.4 inches. That's that's awfully big. It runs uh, the Google Automo or sorry, the Android Automotive autom uh, operating system. Uh, I'm not so sure it's better than like a Kia system or another really good automaker sourced OS, but it's still really good. It's easy enough to use. Um, really beautiful uh, digital gauges, uh, as opposed to very rudimentary, plain, could be in any GM truck gauges. Uh, really improved switch gear. Basically, it's better. It's way better. You know, the column shifter, gone. It has an electronic monostable shifter. I think it'll be just like foreign alien witchcraft to a lot of, you know, pe folks who've been in a GM truck forever with the column shifter, but for if you've been in a lot of other cars, totally normal. Um, so this is the interior that this truck always should have had because it's now like totally compatible. I think it's better than the F-150. Um, it looks better and I think it's more functional. Um, compared to the, this is also notable because Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm absolutely correct here. This is the first time the Sierra and the Silverado have had different interiors. There's a, a couple of asterisks on that because the lower level Sierras have the same interior design as the Silverado, but the Sierra Denali, Denali Ultimate and AT4X have a different design. Is it better than this one? I don't think so, but it's different and that's great. Even though the key elements of the giant screen and a lot of the, the key, you know, functional points are kind of the same, but the looks different and hey, points for effort because none was uh, presented last time they did this uh, truck. Um, the, and then when you talk about, so the Denali, you know, it, it has wood trim in it and it, it seems very nice. Again, much better than it was before. But the Denali Ultimate speaks to its name by really stepping things up. It has beautiful, uh, even like nicer wood trim in it. Uh, the the leather inside is a very specific uh, auburn orangey uh, kind of. Um, there's a spe it, it has a specific uh, ridiculous marketing name, but either way, it's on every Denali Ultimate. It has this very interesting baseball style cross stitch uh, on the doors and then there's some lovely seat piping and then embossed or engraved everywhere is this topographical map of Denali itself. I'm not sure if it's the mountain or the national park but either way it's some place in the national park of um, this is a topographical map it's on the doors it's on the wood it's on the seats in the front and in the back, it's on that rubber uh, cell phone tray I mentioned earlier, it's everywhere. Now, when I say it's everywhere, it could seem like, oh, kind of tacky, like laying it on, but there's so, the interior is so big, it just kind of, it just, it's actually quite classy, it's subdued, it's a nice little bit of, uh, of detail. Um, and in general, I think that interior has it's it's a bit more classy than the you know the king ranches and it's not quite as cowboyish. Now folks like the cowboy aesthetic. It, there's a reason it exists, but uh, in this case, I think there's more broad appeal for Denali Ultimate. It is a it really is a, a lovely interior, and so is the Silverado. So mission accomplished, GM. Well done. Um, the other thing is I drove. Uh, the Sierra had the Duramax diesel engine, and the Silverado had the uh, 6.2 liter uh, V8. Uh, the the 6.2 in the Silverado is a $2,500 option. The Duramax in the Denali is a $1,500 credit. They give you money back, and uh, you should take it. The Duramax uh, is uh, shockingly great. I, I got the car. And I turned it on and I did not realize I was driving the diesel. 
I, I could tell by the power delivery rather than the sound, and usually the sound is you absolutely notice immediately. It's shockingly quiet inside, it's shockingly quiet outside, um, and it gets much better fuel economy, comparable torque to the 6.2 liter, and, you, and it's cheaper. So uh, yeah, uh, big, big points up for the Duramax. 6.2 is fine, but I mean, get, get the diesel, man. It's great. It's interesting. I think the yeah wraps it up. No, that's that's well said. And it's interesting. The last time I drove a Duramax, I didn't realize it was in it immediately. It was actually in the Escalade, and you catch on pretty quick, right? But I think it could be the right engine for a lot of people. You know, you get great mm -hmm. miles on the highway. It's you know a torquey experience. Um, I, I've driven it in, I believe, the Suburban and the Escalade. I, I think I've missed the Yukon, but um, it's a good engine. I mean, it's it's the right engine for some people. And right. I agree with you, too. It's long overdue that they started differentiating the interiors. Um, you, j I mean, it's just everything that they want Sierra to be, for it to be sort of that highest evolution, it can't just be a Chevy. It's got to be something different. So... Um, yeah. I mean, what have you done with these trucks? Have you hauled any mulch? Have you, you know, mm -hmm. what have you been doing with them? Well, that that's a nice thing. So I'm in the process of moving right now. So yeah, the the Sierra was filled with 18 bags of mulch to, you know, in the, in the staging process. And the Silverado has been used to transport uh, boxes uh, from my garage to a storage unit. So I've actually been using the darn things. Um so, which is, you know, it, and you start to appreciate them more. Um, one of the things I, I find, and you're right, with the differentiation between the Sierra and, like, the Denali was, you know, it, so so much of it spoke to just, it, it looked different on the outside, but, like, it didn't, it didn't really translate inside to actually being a more luxurious truck. And that's been the case forever, really. Now it is. Now it is. It, it, it now is, like, appropriately a luxury truck um but the other thing is the, the silver auto really is too and you know i driving them around i would swear that the sierra rode better the silver auto is really kind of a bit harsh and crashing over like like uh bumps around town here slower speeds and i don't remember the sierra doing that that said they I look at the specs and this, the Silverado can now have the adaptive dampers that come standard on the, on the Denali. Uh, and they both had 22 inch wheels. So I'm kind of thinking I'm nuts. Um, but cause in, in theory, they should kind of be the same mechanically, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, you do have to check more option boxes though in the Silverado to get it up to, uh, mechanically the, um, the, the Sierra Denali level. It's interesting when you look at these two trucks, it's sort of why General Motors has never, not recently done any sort of true like Cadillac truck. They don't need to because you can option up the mm. GMC and Chevy models and make them quite luxurious. Yeah. Speak. Yeah, legitimately too. Not just like, oh, look at this giant list of luxury equipment and hey, we look, the the dash of this Silverado High Country is bronze and has some bronze trim instead of silver trim. Ooh, no, they, they tried this time. So speaking but, of uh, Cadillac, what did you do with the Hot Rod Escalade? This is actually a press trip, I want to say, in Scottsdale. Um, yeah. yeah pretty luxurious. I, I tried to, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if what needed the greater carbon offset, the flight there or the drive of the yeah. Escalade V. Uh, basically all highway driving and we did not get 15 miles per gallon. Um, yeah, I, they didn't announce the fuel economy. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be like 13 combined. And, uh, yeah, everybody says like people don't care about fuel economy when they drive a giant SUV like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, to a certain extent though, but I'm not comparing it to like a Highlander hybrid here. I, I mean, a, a Navigator gets 19 miles per gallon. Do you know how much like the dip thousands of dollars per year that you'd save? And judging by, you know, the wealthy's general distaste for paying too much than they need to on taxes. I, I mean, gas price, really? It's going to be different in that way? Whatever. Um, nevertheless, the Escalade V has a crazy powerful engine 
Uh, it's even greater in some respects than the very similar engine in the CT5V Blackwing. It goes very fast. It squats at, at, at the rear like a speedboat when you gun it. It's kind of comical. And it is loud. It is, uh, the when we went out to the press cars uh, at the beginning of the drive, someone turned on uh, the car and the exhaust was literally startling. Uh, it is very loud. Um, which means my first thing when I heard that was, well, what if you need to like go to the airport at like five in the morning and you don't want to wake up everybody in the house and possibly your neighbor, although you may not care about your neighbor. Um, what do you do? There should be like a more obvious like stealth mode. Well, there is literally a stealth mode. It's called that. But you need to have the foresight to engage it before you turn on the car. So either the night before or you need to like go to accessory mode, go click, click, click into the touch screen and then press, uh, then slide over to stealth mode, then turn on the car so you don't wake up the baby. Uh, this was feedback I gave to Sh Cadillac is they should have just a button for like stealth mode or like the little binocular uh, exhaust button they have in a lot of German cars with loud exhausts. So that was my feedback to Cadillac. Otherwise, it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a giant Escalade. And I, we drove the gianter one. We drove the ESV uh, with the, the Escalade V. And uh, yeah, it's, it's something. A lot of people are going to buy them. And uh, they're fast. But uh, I think I'd get the diesel one instead for all the points I mentioned earlier. Because it doesn't sound or really behave like a diesel. It's, uh, it's a pretty great, pretty great deal. And, uh, yeah, not my cup of tea, if, in, in case it's, uh, it's not obvious. Uh, but a lot of people seem to love it, uh, given the responses to our, uh, vid my videos and such on the drive. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd get a Navigator instead. Or the, uh, the, the, the Duramax and the, and the Escalade and save a lot of money like a lot of it's like 50 grand more it's it's ridiculous it uh to me this speaks to almost like the the status level for certain vehicles is you want to say you have everything you could possibly get and that includes the engine um you know you don't need mm -hmm. the kind of raw performance in a truck which is what the escalade really is that kind of just raw like sporty like v performance but you know, I'm interested to drive it, see what it feels like. Um. I will say, I will give them credit for, I was talking to one of the design, the designer for it, and he really, I, I have often, Cadillac's past efforts, especially the V models, I would say I questioned their taste level in terms of the styling and the upgrades to it. Um, that this recent generation of Cadillac has been very, very tasteful, kind of going back to kind of the, the evoking the more of the 1960s Bill Mitchell era, very cool. And they wanted a sleeper look for this car. They did not want to, they didn't want boy racer interior. They didn't want to just slather it with carbon fiber bits. Um, yes, it has the four exhausts. Yes, it has badges, and yes, you know, it has a, you know, a different, uh, some grillettes in the front, slightly sportier front fascia. But that's, that's basically describing, you know, like old AMGs and M5s. They were sleeper cars, and they were cool. Like, if you, when you know what it is, it's cool, and most people wouldn't. And that's also kind of cool. So there's a cool level on this thing that I, I, I absolutely grant them, because they did that very well um and you know like sport maximum escalade could could have really gone wrong into uh, deep into uh, tacky land uh but this absolutely isn't uh, aesthetically speaking i i think it's very good i think uh some of the slightly lower key cadillac designs um especially for the suvs but i mean the cars the ct4 the ct5 I've been uh, a fan of their appearances. You see a few of them on the roads mm -hmm. around here, obviously, but I agree with you. It's that kind of 1960s. You think back to like the Coupe de Ville and cars like that, like after that, you know, famous 57, 59 Cadillac crazy fins thing. It seems like Cadillac mm -hmm. and some automakers go through those phases where they get really like over the top and then things come back and sometimes especially with Cadillac, I think less can be more. 
So Volkswagen Jetta, we'll do a hard fade over to that. Take you back to the early <laughs> yeah. aughts and uh, some other things. But um, it's kind of cool. Early press aughts card. and late 90s too. Late 90s. Yeah, <laughs> when something resonates like that. So um, I had to tell this. So uh, my first car back in late 1999 was a 2000 Volkswagen Jetta VR6. It was Silver Arrow. And I loved it. It was it was like a great friend to me. And, uh, you know, I, I got it in Indianapolis and I drove it across the country to go to college in Southern California to Pepperdine University in Malibu. And uh, and, you know, I drove it across the country. I, I drove it to Toronto for a couple of summers. That's where I'm originally from. So just like this, like it was just woven and it was kind of like this, you know, like loyal dog kind of thing to me in my, you know, formative years, let's say. And uh, I, I still to this day regret selling it. I, you know, in, in an alternate universe, I, I'm i sitting in, fr I'm, it's, it's parked right in front of me here in Portland. Um, so I'm moving back to Southern California. In fact, I'm moving not too far away from where I went to college, not in Malibu. I'm, Autoblog doesn't pay that well, but you know, kind of, kind of close to it. And I'm going back, was going to go uh, do something related to the house search, but primarily I was in town to go drive the new Volkswagen Arteon. And for logistical purposes, it's not unheard of for a car company to leave uh, a car at an airport for us to, to go to the event. Uh, it's easier than, the, the, it, just logistically, it's normal for car companies to leave air, uh, cars at airports uh, it, it's just a normal thing. Anyway, so I didn't really pay much attention to the car that I was going to get and uh, figured it would, you know, obviously going to be Volkswagen to get it. It's a silver Jetta, silver Jetta. So I'm like returning home and there, there is like the, the beacon of like really the past sitting right there. Um, this one, uh, obviously 22 years later is, uh, quite, quite different. It's three generations on. It's a lot bigger. Um, it now has a tiny four-cylinder turbo engine rather than a big, hilariously thirsty by modern standards, uh, small angle V6. Um, this one had a manual. Mine didn't. I, I couldn't get a manual at the time. I also didn't know how to drive one, but uh, still, more importantly, couldn't get one. Um, and uh, it was just a, just a nice like trip down memory lane. And it's, it's, nice to be able to you know the two cars ultimately are nothing similar but there's just a little bit of that shared dna you pick out it's not like it's not like hanging out with an old friend it's more like hanging out with their son <laughs> i'd imagine where you're just like it's familiar and there's just like those little glimpses that like take you back and uh that's kind of the nice thing about cars is because they're almost like they're almost like like living bits of history and this is kind of a different scenario of that, but they kind of let you relive history. It's probably why old dudes like old cars so much. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's just one of those nice little trips down memory lane. And uh, the new Jetta, it's a I, I base model too. This is like the base S manual, like nothing on it. Uh, this thing was cheaper than my Jetta from 1999. It was three grand cheaper, which... I mean, yes, this was the base model, and mine was almost the close, not quite loaded, but, you know, I had lots of equipment on it, but still, it's 22 years. And importantly, the Jetta has gone from kind of a premium alternative uh, to like a Honda Civic, um, kind of like operating... It, it's almost like like what like the Integra is now, or it's one of those um, kind of like that, like kind of luxury adjacent it could be, but definitely a more premium entry in the compact segment. And now it's more like budget oriented, and you know going for maximum value in terms of they lowered the price a lot and they've made it enormous. So it's market segment I think primarily is the biggest difference after all these years. Um, still, uh, it was. Uh, an enjoyable experience. Nostalgia is a powerful thing. It sort of takes us back. It um, makes us, you know, remember things in some ways, perhaps better than we might have, you know, they might have been the first time. But that's mm -hmm. that's cool. It's been a while since I've had a press card that, you know, did that for me. So um, 
that's cool. Yeah. Well, I guess the other thing is it far more than like, you know, I've had like a, a BMW, the latest Z4. And, you know, that one is that just is just the same. The same feelings do not evoke that. Maybe it's because I still have the Z3. There you go. But uh, or like even like I owned a TSX and it's not it's it's not the same like driving a TLX now. But it's that emotional connection you had that with that, you know, that, that one car of old. Um, that even though like the car can be totally and you know what? I think Integra. Let's talk about Integra for a second, because that's basically, that's very similar, right? That car is like a vastly improved, um, better Acura ILX. That's really what that is. It's just a redone, it's a, it's an Accord, it's a Civic based, you know, better ILX. But they called it Integra. And therefore, folks who owned Integra's car enthusiasts got really excited about it. It's, it's all in the name. And that really, it's the power, I don't know if it's the power of marketing, it's a power of nostalgia, as you said, um, but it's, it's, it's definitely a related phenomenon. I mean, you saw that with the return of the Charger, uh, people really got into it mm -hmm. and had four doors, you know, I think people were so starved for that muscle car feel in the turn of the century that they called something that was the replacement for the Dodge Intrepid in some ways, and yeah. people lapped it up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can't wait to drive uh, the Integra. Uh, road test editor Zach Palmer has sort of cautioned me. He's like, you're going to like it probably, but he's like, you know, it's a modern Acura. You know, it's maybe not necessarily get your hopes up, but like also take the marketing with a grain of salt. So, so yeah. A uh, car that did not really stir my emotions, but I liked was the BMW X3 M40i. Uh, it was $64,000. So I thought it was actually a fairly decent deal, uh, all things considered. Uh, it was all black on the outside, uh, kind of a gray and brown interior. And it has that beautiful uh, bi-turbo uh, inline six. So um, in that sense, it was plenty of fun to drive. Uh, this is my second straight week of driving uh, turbocharged inline six German engines because I had the AMG, um, uh, the E class with that as well last week, two weeks ago. So, um, very functional, handled well. I think the steering was solid, if you will. It gave me at least a taste, perhaps to your point, a taste of that BMW like steering that I wanted to feel, even though I was driving a uh, just a relatively small to mid sized crossover. Um, put some miles on it. That's always fun when you can actually really um, take a somewhat of a normal loan and really stretch it out. Um, but yeah, it's a solid entry in the class. I mean, I wouldn't say it's the best. I wouldn't say it's the worst. It um, it's, fits exactly all of the things that a BMW buyer in that class who wants, you know, the bigger engine is going to go for. So um, yeah, it's fun. Uh, and I guarantee you, you enjoyed it more than I enjoyed the X3M competition. Mm. I had that thing. I d d no, no bueno. Did not like that. I, every, everybody who uh, I've heard comment who drove that car uh, all commented, the ride is terrible. It will beat you up. Uh, and they're all right. It is absolutely terrible. It will beat you up. And you drive this car and you go, who is this for? Yeah. Because... You know, oh wow, it's really high performance, and we made it all incredible, so you could drive on a track. Really, who is this person who's driving a BMW X3 on a track? And then, furthermore, yeah, cool. So I want the maximum, like I want the coolest small BMW crossover I can get because I I like cool cars. Blah blah blah. Okay, that that's that's fine. And then, but even if you never intend to drive a track, but now you're going to drive this car around that's going to like beat you up and annoy your wife and children that you're buying this car that they've, that it's going to beat them up. And it's just, it's, who is this for? And who is actually going to be played? I don't get it. I'm, I, when you say X3 I, competition, I, you start to lose me. I'm like, what, what do you need all that for? Right. Competition. Right. It's in the name competition. What, what are you competing in? Like BMW, what? Like buy a buy a real car for the track, or buy a more comfortable car, like a better, more appropriate car for the daily drive, 
ant like it, it's such a it's such a spork and not even a very good spork um it, yeah, tries to do two things at once and doesn't do them well at all. Ironically, sporks are not highly useful. Taco Bell used to hand them out all the time. And I don't, you know, outside of their messy nachos, there weren't many applications for it. You might be better off either with a fork or a spoon or a Honda HRV, like what you just drove. Yes. Oh, that's a segue. Uh, yeah, so the HRV, this is like one of the. Uh, it's, it's, it's always really interesting when a car, uh, changes, goes from generation to generation and it is like totally different, not just like the evolution, uh, method. Uh, it is like sea change thing. So the old, uh, HRV was very much based on the Honda fit. You could tell just was the same engine and well, hold on. Don't quote me to that. Maybe it wasn't the same engine. Either way, it was not much of an engine. And, uh, but the floor plan was the same. So the gas tank under the front seats, that means the back seat and the cargo floor can be super low and fold into the, fold into the, um, into the floor very flatly. This provided it with an amazing amount of interior space relative its footprint. Well, the new car, no longer based on the fit. It's not even the same vehicle as it, the vehicle that it replaced, sorry, never mind. let's not go down to what's sold in Europe, then it really gets confusing. So it's no longer based on the fit. It is instead a lot, of, I even say in the video, it's based on the Civic. It's, it's not, it's, there's a lot of Civic bits. You can really see it in the interior, but there's also a lot of current generation CRV in its, um, in its suspension. Um, and you know, it's, it's as quiet as the current CRV. And so it, it's kind of a mixture of both. And, and the end result is that it is a far more um, kind of uh, solid, uh, sophisticated isn't the best word, but let's go with it. It just feels like a more substantial car, definitely moving up uh, a quasi segment, if you will. It's no longer a subcompact SUV. It's kind of in that, that mid compact area that we call um, the segment with like the Kia Seltos, VW Taos, uh, Bronco Sport, uh, kind of kind of in that range where it's still smaller than a CRV, but it's bigger than it was before. And uh, because of it no longer having that Honda Fit interior uh, packaging, it's a lot bigger on the outside, but the interior isn't really that much bigger. It sure it feels bigger, and um, especially in the back seat, it, it's a totally different packaging scenario. So there's more space between the rows, which will be good if you have like a rear facing child seat or just a general feel of spaciousness. But because the seat's lower, you don't necessarily have as much uh, leg room. Like imagine the difference between sitting on, I don't know, a stool and then like a kitchen chair. Um, that's, that's kind of what the, the difference is between them. Um, so you can sit close in the old fit, you can sit closer to the front seats and yet still have enough room because you're higher off the ground. Cargo space it like on paper is the same, but I think the old one might be more useful. Um, and to drive it, yeah, it does, it does feel larger. It's quieter. Um, the ride is better. Uh, the handling is more composed because it's an independent rear suspension now instead of a torsion beam. Uh, it has more power, but uh, we're we're starting at a low bar, and it didn't really clear it by much. It is still very slow. It has absolutely no low end power at all. I mean, you, I, I drove it at some elevation, and I thought, okay, well, this is kind of an unfair uh, test for it. But then I got it back to close to sea level, and it still was it, nothing happens when you gun the engine, and it has a CVT. It now simulates gears as many CVTs do. It has a sport mode, which is, and a low gear, which is more, it's better suited for going downhill to ensure some uh, engine braking, as opposed to any semblance of sportiness. I found that I could, I could have used paddle shifters a bit when I was really pushing it, but that's so not what this car is for. And Honda basically said as much. They were just looking for like, they, they talked to focus groups. They found that, nope, 
the current they did no nope, current owners and those in the market did not want more power they wanted to to be sufficient they didn't want to pay for more than they wanted so honda gave them the base civic engine not even didn't even want to offer the the turbo as an as an option um the the reason what part an additional reason for not offering it they said that the turbo civic trim levels because the engine is tied to trim levels those turbo civic uh, the turbo civics are purchased uh by a majority of those buyers are men whereas oh about 70 percent of this segment of the hrv segments buyers are women and so yeah, i think that there was something going on there when they're reading the demographics about who buys what engine so therefore if not a lot of men are going to buy the hrv therefore we're not going to put in the engine that the men want i guess that's what they were saying i don't know but uh, so that's why the hrv is slow <laughs> there's no option to make it better and when you and it's like and again this is not slow for like the entire automotive segment i'm not comparing it to the escalate v i'm comparing it to like a kia seltos and uh or like the 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 subaru crosstrek widely considered painfully slow so slow that Subaru's focus groups determined that, yeah, you know, actually people do want more power and we're just going to give them a bit more power and people are going to be happy. And that is exactly what happened. The base Crosstrek has more torque than the HRV. So, uh, yeah. Um, so lo very low bar and uh, they kind of just kept the bar there for, for this generation. It's interesting. It's you mentioned this in your dispatch last week. It's a bigger car, but you don't get much more space, somewhat oddly. And it sounds like it, you yeah. sit kind of weirdly in it. What um, I mean? Oh no, no. Sorry, I, I shouldn't say sit weirdly. It's it's a, the seat's a little, long, little low. But again, it's more that it's more that the old car was weird. Yeah. Right. This one is more conventional. Like you sit in the interior, and it does have like a fair a a, a good sized back seat for the segment. Uh, the back, the front seats are much better with, but without the gas tank being underneath and without being, uh, kind of based on a Japanese market subcompact car, uh, th there's a lot more, uh, um, seat adjustability, which is indicative of a car meant for the American market. Um, and that th I'm tall, so I can actually fit comfortably in the HRV, whereas in the old HRV and the fit, not even remotely close to fitting comfortably in those cars. Um, so the so basically, the car is more conventional now, and for the segment, it is uh, totally competitive and strong in terms of space in many regards. Uh, it's it mostly speaks to the old car being kind of it will be weird yeah well that's a natural evolution uh, i think or a needed evolution i remember like you know we would often say why would you get this over the fit now your average consumer would say well this feels more more like a crossover air quotes whereas the fit you know whatever that's just a small car then enthusiasts say well i like driving a small car you can get a manual transmission this thing's great but I mean, they really did need to kind of make this more competitive. And our we did a compact crossover comparison a few years ago at this point, and we didn't like it. It did not fare well. And frankly, the field at that time was okay. It's gotten much stronger, but this is definitely, um, you know, a little bit of a, it's a better version of itself. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I think, and it's also interesting because, you know, the HRV was one of those first subcompact SUVs like at the yeah. time like it came out just I think just after the Renegade and 500X twins and like the term subcompact SUV wasn't a thing like we just kind of figured well if these are smaller than compact SUVs like a CRV therefore I guess they're subcompacts and then like the Kia Soul, which had been on sale forever as like this weird Scion XB hatchbacky thing, all of a sudden, well, wait, it's just like these things. I guess it's a subcompact SUV too. Um, but then as we go on in years, they, you know, we, in the last couple of years, we've seen them get just a little bigger, like noticeably bigger. And that's why we had to come up with this idea of subcompact because like a Seltos is bigger than a soul 
and bigger than a Hyundai um well, Venue, Venue has, Hyundai even has a smaller size, uh, and a Hyundai uh, Kona. So, like, the, you can see that there are defined sub-segments, and you couldn't just call them the same thing. So, clearly, Honda sees that that's where the market's going, that these little things are less appealing than the slightly bigger ones. Also, one would assume the bigger, all the bigger ones are more expensive, you know, higher profit margin, perhaps. And, uh, you know, there's just going to be even fewer and fewer and fewer uh, cheaper cars out there for folks. Um, yeah. Something that assuredly won't be uh, cheap or inexpensive is the Cadillac Lyric. John uh, is on location testing this one out. Uh, he'll give us more of a full review uh, in an upcoming episode. But let's hear what it's like on site with the Cadillac Lyric. Over to you, John. Thanks, Greg. I'm here in Park City, Utah, and I've just finished up my first driving stint in the 2023 Cadillac Lyric. I've been waiting to get behind the wheel of this car for over two years. I first saw this car alongside the Cadillac Celestic at GM's EV Day back in 2020, just before the pandemic became a thing. I was really impressed with the Lyric then, and I'm glad to see the similarities uh, to that show car in the production model. Just a little background, this is Cadillac's first ever electric vehicle, and it's the second GM product after the GMC Hummer EV to use GM's new Ultium electric powertrain. Uh, that's a modular battery system that can scale for whatever size vehicle or whatever role GM needs it to play. In this case, it's a mid-size crossover. As such, uh, the Lyric's battery pack is about half the size of the Hummer's. Um, that one is essentially two Lyric packs stacked on top of one another. In the Lyric's case, the battery has a capacity just a little over 100 kilowatt hours, which in the rear wheel drive version gives it a driving range of 312 miles on a charge. And that's the version I'm driving today. The all wheel drive version will use the same battery, have another motor, uh, so it'll have more power, but less range. Speaking of which, the other major component of the Ultium platform is its electric motors. The rear drive Lyric uses just one, providing 300 ho 340 horsepower and 325 pound-feet of torque. So even this less powerful variant is still quite potent. I can't really tell you how that on-paper performance translates to driving feel. You'll have to wait until the June 28th embargo on driving impressions, but I can tell you about some of the other impressions the Lyric left on me. For instance, it's absolutely gorgeous interior. Uh, the first thing you notice getting inside is the 33 inch curved LED display stretching across the dash. It serves as both an infotainment screen on the right side and instrument panel on the left in front of the driver. It's powered by Google's Android automotive operating system, which you're familiar with from the Polestar 2 but this has a look and feel all its own. Still, it has sort of that seamless and quick user experience Android users already know and love. Uh, it's a touch screen, uh, but you can also control some menu functions from a rotary dial and hard buttons on the center console. Uh, that rotary dial could easily be confused uh, for a shifter. Uh, the interior is lovely. It's quite spacious and comfortable. Uh, the one I'm driving has uh, synthetic seating material, uh, sort of a faux, faux leather, which is super soft and the seats are incredibly comfortable and they give you a massage, um, which is always nice. But Cadillac will also offer a Napa leather version if you want the real thing. Um, but the thing that struck me the most uh, about the Lyric is the craftsmanship and the attention to detail. Uh, the designers were allowed to basically start from scratch. So pretty much everything you see and touch is unique to the Lyric and nothing is from, you know, some GM parts bin. Uh, that makes this interior very unique. There are nice little details like jeweled metal for the switch gear. And that pattern is repeated in places like the infotainment dial around the rim of the cup holders and even inside the little lights in the ceiling above the rear passenger doors. It's really impressive. Uh, there are also some interesting details like dual polishes on the metal. 
like one side of a piece of trim will be smooth and shiny while the surface facing you will have a brushed look to it. There are also tiny pieces of uh, metal in like a hematite color. Uh, there's an insert smaller than a Tic Tac on the bottom of the steering wheel and uh, a thin ring around a knob here and there in the same finish. It's the sort of detail you might not even notice until you've lived with the car for a while. But luckily, I've got Lyric Interior Design Manager Tristan Murphy on hand at this trip to answer questions and point things out like that to me, along with you know, some Easter eggs, uh, some neat stuff. Uh, everything in this car looks and feels high quality and thought through. There's nothing haphazard about the Lyric. They even managed to make the sounds of the switch gear sort of match each other around the car. They, that's something they actually thought about was the, the clicking sound of, of the vent knob and the C adjustment. They wanted to all be sort of coherent, really, really cool stuff. Um, there's a big storage bin uh, below the floating center console that's uh, lined with what looks like leather, uh, blue leather, beautiful. Uh, there's another bin that slides out from the center stack, also lined in blue leather that honestly looks like a drawer from my wife's jewelry cabinet. Um, that blue, that same blue is, is repeated in piping uh, down the center of the seat backs. It's a nice little touch. Um, in the cargo area, I love this detail, there's underfloor storage uh, with a big deep bin. And there's also a spot specifically designed to stash the cargo cover as well as a spot for the mobile charging cable. Uh, that cable, by the way, is dual level. So it has attachments for 120 volt and 240 volt outlets. So if you don't want to, you don't even need to buy a separate charging station for level two charging if you've got a NEMA plug in your garage. Uh, the, the cable is limited to 7.7 .7 kilowatts. So about 17 to 19 miles of range per hour of charging. Uh, while with a proper level two station, you can get uh, up to 37 or 52 miles per hour of charging, depending on which onboard charger your Lyric has. It's a little confusing, but don't let it bother you. Anyway, uh, oh, the Lyric also has Super Cruise, uh, but I won't be able to try that out uh, as it's not activated yet. That will come later in the year with an over the air update. Uh, anyway, we've talked about how excellent uh, Super Cruise is, um, you know, the hands-free highway driving system uh, that won the Autoblog at Tech of the Year a couple years ago. And uh, I don't expect the Lyric to be any different. The Lyric also has a number of drive modes like Tour, Sport, and Snow and Ice, as well as a customizable mode where you can mix, mix and match individual settings for steering, braking, acceleration, and even the uh, acceleration sound that's piped in through the speakers. Uh, I'll be sure to play more with those tomorrow and tell everyone about them in the review. So yeah, June 28th, you can read all about the actual Lyric Drive experience. Until then, I'll be posting photos to Twitter, including the Autoblog Green account. And I'll get some videos for YouTube. Uh, by the time you're hearing this, I should have a walk around video up on the Autoblog YouTube channel. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. I've got an even bigger day of driving ahead of me tomorrow. From Park City, Utah, and the launch of the 2023 Cadillac Lyric, I'm John Snyder. Back to you, Greg. All right. Thanks, John. Safe travels back. James, should we spend some money? Sure. Let's do it. Um, that's podcast at autoblog.com. If you have spent my monies, please send them in. We Summertime is a great time to spend money. Sometimes we have less car news. So this is a really good opportunity for you to kind of take control of the podcast. And if you have questions, uh, we also like to do mailbags. So send them in. Again, that's podcast at autoblog.com. Dan in Colorado writes, he's looking for a good used car for under $20,000, something that gets good gas mileage and has all wheel drive. What do you recommend? James, let's start with you. I think we should learn. Aren't we just talking about which Subaru you recommend? It's tricky. It's tricky because I was going to I mean, go with a Mazda, but no all-wheel drive there. Oh. So, yeah, I mean, it's Colorado. Oh. So I guess you have to have the all-wheel drive, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, he's Colorado. Okay. So, <sighs> so, so elevation. So let's, uh, the Crosstrek 
is not turbocharged, so that's not great. But if you try and find a turbo one, the gas mileage probably won't be all great, because it, if it's older, then that means it has the four-speed auto. So, um, yeah, I think I'm still thinking find a Crosstrek. Okay. That's... Because they're kind of cool. I like them. Um, I guess, I mean, if you want it, I mean, you can get a WRX. I mean, it depends on what your definition of good gas mileage is. Yeah. You know? If it's like Prius, then no, I'm sorry, you're screwed. Um, but if it's better than a lot of things, you could... Uh, WRX would be fun. It is it is all wheel drive. It might be beaten up at under twenty, so maybe that was a terrible suggestion on my part. Um, yeah, you could find a Turbo Forester. That would be that'd be kind of neat. Yeah, that was an interesting version of the Forester. Thinking back, um, I would go with like a fourteen fifteen Outback. Caveat being, what's good gas mileage? That's probably not going to be great for you, but you could get find one under twenty. Um, if you do want better gas mileage there, Dan, I think Crosstrek is probably your best bet to go down that road as far as the all-wheel drive. If you can get past the all-wheel drive thing, check out a Mazda 3, maybe a lightly used one. That would be a lot of fun to drive. Um, if you need like snow tires or something, you know, maybe that would help you out with some of the Colorado, uh, snow and terrain, but, uh, those would be the sort of the three I would throw at you. Oh, I, I would say you can get a. Uh, there's there's actually one right around the corner from me, and I and I drove one back in the day. Out back with a manual. Oh, that's interesting. The last gen. Well, maybe now two generations ago, out back. So the first generation that got big, right? You could get that with a manual, and it was it was it was oddly fun. It had like big balloony tires, and it was it was kind of enjoyable. I I. I, I I was mildly amused, and I'm sure that would be that would definitely be under twenty grand today. That'd be fun. Find one of those. That that's that's my recommendation. Here's another thing too. Depending on how what sort of silhouette you're tied to, the Ford Escape. Uh, you can find like a 2019 Escape, maybe 2017 Escape with all wheel drive. Um, mm -hmm. That would get in like you know you're talking about somewhat respectable fuel economy. Uh, Dan doesn't really specify here if it's a car per se or just anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, an escape, like a 2018, 19 escape, that's basically a car. You know, you're, you're not that far off the ground. You could get some all wheel no. drive on that. So my, that's one to look at. My parents own one of those. They own that generation. It would be older. It's whenever yeah. the first or second model year of that generation was. And that's a fun, that's a fun car. I still to this day enjoy driving it. And I, think the interior is nicer than the current car yeah and um i i kind of like it better than the current one in many respects now uh i will say it is known for not being particularly reliable i had a friend who i i recommended to and after like seven years its transmission imploded and that was that was all she wrote for that sucker um but uh yeah, I, I I would I would at least warn about that because that it ain't a Honda CRV. Really. Well, actually, you know what? Never uh, the CRV had transmission problems too. It's not a Toyota Rav4. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, if you're willing to get kind of like a small, compact, subcompact, whatever kind of you know crossover, you could get all-wheel drive on some of those. And well, Kona. Kona could be a good one. Yeah, the Kona. You could definitely get a used one under twenty. That thing's a hoot. That's a, that's actually a surprisingly fun little car, and you can get like a like a cool engine on that too with all wheel drive. Yeah, that'd be something to consider. The Kona actually finished, I believe, second in our compact crossover in twenty nineteen comparison. We it, it's funny at the time you mentioned sub versus compact. We called it compact, but the market was even moving at that time when we labeled those vehicles as such. And now you see like the CRV. The Escape, the Equinox, it just seems like things that were one thing have gotten larger and, and morphed, if you will, into other segments. Here's one that yeah. I'm not recommending, but you could get a 2015 Chrysler 200S with all-wheel drive. Um, don't do that. But I just happened to come across that when I was searching. Forgot the 200 at all-wheel drive. I did not know that. Uh, or if I did, I've forgotten it. So, yeah. Um, cool. Well. Dan, thanks for writing. If you enjoy the podcast, that's five stars on Apple Podcasts. 
We're available on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Again, send us your Spend My Monies podcast at autoblog.com. Be safe out there. We'll see you next week.